What does it feel like to sell your blog for $20 million? Brian Kelly. One of the most famous people in the world when it comes to travel. He's a regular on Live with Kelly and Mark. He's going on vacation with Martha Stewart. You've accomplished something pretty extraordinary. What advice do you have for brand new content creators starting today? Um... Without further ado, my name is Carmen Sanyovi. This is Small Steps, Big Moves, the podcast about the business of influence and content creation. And here is my interview with Brian Kelly. What was it like to travel to Antarctica with Martha Stewart? <laughs> well, actually, it was Greenland, but Antarctica is oh, on my list. Okay, yes. Okay. Uh, so Greenland, apparently, I haven't done Antarctica yet. Okay. Um, but the cruise company uh, or expedition company, Swan Hellenic, has invited me. I, don't, I can't do both poles in one year. They were like, how great would that be? I'm like, I'm not a big cruiser, so mm. so I loved it. Um, so we can talk about Greenland second. Let's talk about Martha Stewart first, because yes, she's an icon. So people were like, did you just happen to be on that cruise with her? I'm like, I actually met her six or seven years ago um, on an entrepreneurship cruise. I was kind of dating someone she did business with. I met her and then... Um, that year I went to her house for Thanksgiving. Nice. We've traveled to Svalbard. So Martha and I became friends even after, I, I didn't date her friend very for very long, but yeah. Martha and I stayed in touch. She's been on my podcast. I love her. I think, you know, in a certain way, she used to work in finance, left her career That's right. to pursue her passion and built a brand and an empire that she sold and then is still a part of. And mm -hmm. when I look at my career, there's a lot of parallels to that. Worked yep. at Morgan Stanley, loved travel built and sold a site, still works for the site, building personal brand, building the, brand. you know, so it's, I think what she's done is like, if there's anyone out there, I don't, you know, have necessarily peers who exactly do what I do in the influencing world. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of travel influencers, but there's few, I think that have built um, the media companies that I have, mm -hmm. and then have pushed themselves personally as a brand. There's a lot of like prolific bloggers out there. but so. It's interesting. So I think Martha Stewart's an icon. She's fascinating to travel with. She is super smart and like going on tours with her is fascinating. Cause and also traveling with her, I'm used to being the friend that opens all the doors for my friends. <laughs> so I love being with Martha. Cause we went to Svalbard and we, we actually got into the global seed vault. This is years ago oh. where you can't get in. It's the world seeds under the permafrost in the northernmost city in the world. And of course going with Martha, they opened up the vault and we wow. got to go inside. So Martha's like, you know, traveling with her is a treat to say the <laughs> least. And she's a lot of fun. Yeah, no, that's amazing. Um, so let's take it back to the beginning. Um, how did you first get interested in travel and maybe specifically also a war travel? Yeah, so it really does go back to the 90s. So I'm, I just turned 40 this year. So in 1990, I was seven years old and I got my first PC and it was like MS-DOS. This was before Windows was even around. So for my elder millennials and Gen Xers out there, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And it, I remember for Christmas uh, in 1991, I got a Prodigy internet packet where you used to actually buy your internet um, in a burlap bag and install the modem, plug your phone line in. So that wonderful age, sound also. Yeah, the screeching, <laughs> am I gonna get through? Then it became so popular in the AOL days, it would just be busy. So, yeah. But I basically at age eight became the computer whiz of my family. And then over the years, early 90s, I'm like hacking on AOL and IRC rooms and stuff. So my dad in 1995 got a job, he worked in like healthcare consulting um, and he got a job at a startup. So we live in the Philly suburbs and all of a sudden he's working from home. He always had a secretary his whole life. And I was the computer whiz and he had a, I remember he had a laptop. He's like, I need to book all my own travel. Mm. So my first job was booking his flights because his company was in LA. So he would fly Philly, LA almost every week. So he had American Airlines miles, he had US Airways miles. And basically he came to me one day and said, if you can use all these points, you know, book our family on a trip. He's like, I don't know what what we can do with. He and I remember he had a big bunch. He had a bunch of U.S. Airways miles and American miles, but not enough for all six of us. I'm mm -hmm. one of four kids, so I got on the phone. I schmoozed uh, Sheila at U.S. Airways, you know, <laughs> and I learned very early on at age 12, like be nice. Yeah. If you're so, if you're nice to airline reps, they can do a lot, especially back in the 90s. I mean, it's a wild, wild west. So, mm -hmm. booked our family of six. We went to the Cayman Islands for free 
Wow. And I rented a house on Verbo. Actually, Verbo had just launched and Travelocity had just launched. Wow. Um, okay. Yeah, that's all the way really back then. early and I remember on, thinking, yeah. so I rented this beautiful house in, uh, it was called Maiden Plum Kai. It was in um, Rum Point of Grand Cayman. So everyone goes to Grand Cayman, cruises at Seven Mile Beach, crowded, touristy. Well, if anyone who wants to go to the Cayman Islands, go to Rum Point. It is this idyllic uh, on the northern side of the island. And we rented this house from a doctor who had a vacation home in the Caymans now for the first time ever was able to put it up on the internet. So we have the most amazing trip in 96. And then that became me and my dad throughout the 90s. That was our bonding. So mm -hmm. he would travel. We would, there, there used to be all these weird points promotions on cereal boxes, Wendy's, Frosties. You used to be able to get airline miles. <laughs> really? So that was like our bond. I had no clue that there was like a world out there doing this. And then in 2001, I went to college and 9-11 happened the first week of my uh, freshman year, which obviously put aviation, you know, I, I remember thinking I'm never going to be able to travel. And I was going to school in Pittsburgh and I grew up outside of Philly. So I remember after 9-11, all these low cost carriers came into the market and it was like $25 to fly home. Mm. It was cheaper than Greyhound. Wow. So I started flying Southwest and every four round trips, you get a free flight. And I would go visit my friends in LA and Tucson and Vegas. So I'd spend like, my parents would spend 200 bucks to fly me home. I would go home for weekends just because it would be cheaper to fly home than to go to a, you know, a bar. So that was like, I started maximizing points myself. I started to get elite status. And then in, in, I realized, um, I think I was Googling in 2004. That's when I discovered the, oh my gosh, there's a whole community of people out here. It's called Flyer Talk. And mm. Flyer Talk is still around today. Um, and, but it's a, you know, kind of like Reddit uh, forums for everything frequent flyer and I just dove right in. I mean, it took a couple months to speak the lingo. People kind of held a lot of secrets close to their chest. Oh, yeah, that's every community, yes, right? Yes, <laughs> exactly. So get into that. Uh, long story short, I start, I study abroad in Spain. And so in the early 2000s, I became a part of the points underground and um, eventually got a job at Morgan Stanley where I started traveling like crazy. And I realized my corporate card, I called up one day and if I paid $95, I could get the Amex points. And I was in college recruiting. So my job was to be, you know, we were recruiting computer scientists and this, the year is 07, 08, 09. So right, Wall Street's in crisis, but luckily for me, I was in technology. So Wall Street, you had to hire computer scientists, whether you liked it or not, like not investing in technology in the late aughts was like not, you know, Google's blowing up, Microsoft, Yahoo. So my job was, in high demand and I had no budget because mm. I had to convince MIT computer science graduates to join Morgan Stanley when they can go to Google. Right. So my company, you know, Morgan Stanley was like, pay whatever. I was whining, dining. I was flying 50 kids at a time to New York City. I was putting all their hotels on my credit card. Wow. So I became like a points millionaire. Mind you, I'm making 70,000 a year, mm -hmm. you know, in New York City. I'm broke. I'm literally living paycheck to paycheck, but I've got millions of points. So I would take the subway on the weekends. I'd fly Emirates first class. Wow. I was living a double life, you know, <laughs> and I, uh, I, we made merch once that said points, rich, cash, poor. <laughs> and that's so many of our, so many in our audience. So, are accurate, like, yeah. so I was living this unbelievable lifestyle. And, um, finally, you know, every year I was not getting bonuses, promotion. I was frustrated because I was working my ass off. And then I was seeing everyone get laid off. And I'm like, these lifelong employees of the bank are just getting laid. And I would have to help with the layoffs because I was in HR. Oh, yeah. And that was so uh, I, I was also in finance in 2008. And uh, so it was a wild time. Wild. Yeah. I mean, I was in HR. So, I mean, let's talk about Sunday scaries. On yeah. Sunday, being in HR, they would send spreadsheets, RIF, and reduction in force. So I would get a list Sunday night. I get chills thinking about it. Ugh. Okay, all of these people's, like, you know, careers are, you know, I'm gonna have to fire, oh, I work with that person for four years wow. and I'd have to be there. And I was the Grim Reaper. Ugh. So I would be in a suit, because I'm six, seven, outside of the door. You would say, hey, come to the conference room and people would know what was happening. And then I would actually have to follow them, not let them go to their desk, because it would disturb others. Mm. Unless they really, really pushed, then we couldn't say no. Yeah. No, don't worry, we'll send it to you. And um, so I would have to get in the elevator and they'd be like, okay, see ya. And I'm like, no, well, I actually need to ride down and watch you leave the turnstile wow. for security reasons. And it just was so soul crushing. And I get it, like, I mean, the world was in crisis, the banks had to do what they had to do, but I realized this isn't for me. You know, and even just looking at my boss's bosses, you know, the head of HR at the bank, exhausting, stressful work, very important, but it, it was not like my, what gave me passion, yeah. you know? So I ended up not getting bonuses, not getting, I was 
mad. And then my ex-boyfriend at the time was like, you're a points expert. You know, naturally, all of our friends come to you. You should start a side hustle, you know, the points guy, where you people pay you 50 bucks and you do what you already do for free and you love doing. So that was the points guy in 2010. Most people don't realize it was never even a blog. It was just a form. In April of 2010, I had this form. Where you would put in all your points. It would email me and I'd say, yeah, I can help you. PayPal me a hundred bucks and I'll tell you how to use your Amex points to go to Iceland or wherever. Mm. So that was the business. So I was working Morgan Stanley. I would come home and have my like points travel agency. And then it was June of 2010. And a tip I'll give to everyone is maintain good relationships. Even when you leave a company or you're... And you know, fellow employees quit, leave, get fired, stay in good contact with people because that network can change your life, which it did for me. Mm. My former work wife, her husband was a WordPress developer in 2010. Oh. I had no idea what WordPress was. We stayed in touch. She lived in Staten Island. She was like, come over, hang out. Um, Dave is gonna set you up with the blog because he thinks if you blog, naturally you'll be able to get all these clients who will pay you for your services. So June of 2010, I went, he set me up with my own WordPress theme and his advice was, Brian, just blog every single day, same time, and trust me, people will come because what you have to say is so interesting. Don't don't buy cheap Chinese traffic to <laughs> spice up your stats for yeah. advertisers. Don't buy link backs. Don't do any of that. He's like, just do good content every single day. So I did June of 2010, I started blogging. So then I was just so stressed. I'd working full time, doing my travel agency. Then I'd have to write a blog post every day. So. My, I was in a relationship. I thought I was going to get married to the guy, but torpedoed my relationship because I had no extra. I didn't have enough time for myself. Yeah. But the blog started to take off, and um, you know, in early 2011, my life changed. The New York Times ended up writing about the site, wow. and then affiliate marketing. A friend from college who I stayed in contact with was like, "I work for." Uh, what was it, Linkshare, which is now Rakuten. Mm -hmm. And he's like, I'm on the credit cards division account. And he's like, you're so dumb. You're writing about credit cards every day and you're linking directly to their websites. He's like, <laughs> use a simple link I'll give you, same content, and you'll get paid $200 a card. Wow. And I was like, sign me up. And from that was really what changed my life. Wow, that's incredible. So one thing that's super interesting about your story is that the story of a lot of creators, bloggers, whatever you want to call it, right? is a lot of them start making content and then they sort of flounder until they find a business model. Mm -hmm. But you sort of did it a little bit the other way around where you were already making money, you were already monetizing through the sort of one-on-one -on -one consulting. Yep. And then you were like, let me blog to get more customers. Yeah. And then of my, course- My dad know. pulled me aside and said, you need to figure out how to make money in your sleep. And mm -hmm. I remember being like, duh, idiot, like who doesn't? But it was true because he's like, you have so much knowledge in your head, but he's like, you can't outsource that. He's like, yep. what? how are you going to take this travel booking business? Are you going to train, you know, offshore call centers with this deep <laughs> knowledge and, you know, or even just other people. And, and that's the interesting thing about the points knowledge. Most people who have deep points knowledge are lawyers, consultants. You know, they don't they're not going to want to mm. part time, really, um, yeah. because the. And the travel booking was tough because I would you'd spend a couple hours. Some would be easy, you know. I oh I know how to get you, I, and I had all these tools that I could search for availability. But then people would flake out, or so it was like it was a grind. Mm -hmm. um, but you know the affiliate marketing, and in 2011 I was kind of an outcast. Affiliate, affiliate marketing was like spammy, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. And I worried for years, like, am I going to get booked on the Today Show? Will tra Connie Nash Traveler, you know, respect me because I'm hawking products, mm -hmm. you know? And it's hysterical now to look back and think, well, now what I pioneered in travel and credit cards made us the most profitable travel website in the world, you know, travel content site. But now everyone else is trying to get in on the game. And it's, and now, funny enough, the points guy, we have our own partner program where big time publishers and travel publishers and content creators now get their links through us. So mm -hmm. um, it's definitely, it was definitely an evolution. Yeah, and it's funny, those media brands that you mentioned worrying about, right, to today's show, they all publish articles littered with affiliate links. Littered, yeah, and, and really within the last several years <laughs> yeah. because they realized that's the only way to do it. And, and you know, I started doing it in 2011 and that's how I expanded. I mean, that's how I got the points guy. It was just me and a couple people. You know, we've got now 125 people. Um, we built it into something amazing on affiliate success. And so many people will say, well, how do you do that? Having credibility with your readers and making money. 
And I was transparent from day one. And even when I quit my job, I said, hey, please use my links. You know, and I just I would say this, you have $100, you have a $100 bill. Do you wanna put it in my pocket so I can give you more content that saves you thousands of dollars? Or do you wanna throw it into a cauldron into a multi-billion dollar international banks? That's your choice, right? Yeah. Like you can get the same offer, but do you throw a hundred to a bank or do you give it to a blogger who will use that to hire writers that make you money? Mm -hmm. And I think my my readers have always been like, hell yeah, they're they're in and part of my success. For sure, I had many years and it was interesting because when I started monetizing, I was one of the first travel points bloggers and then it was the gold rush of gold rushes. Everyone found <laughs> out I was making money and I remember there was another block and that they all started to hate me. And, mm -hmm. you know, and, and this is a part of any creator will respond to the jealousy and uh, I remember I had to get thick skin real quick there were actually so all the other points bloggers knew it was such a like a gold mine you know and I, I do joke I mean I was blogging on a gold mine you know credit I had a high-end audience that had a lot of money and great credit and wanted to travel and then what's the most lucrative affiliate on the internet credit cards but it takes a lot to get someone to apply for credit card, change their auto pays, get a hit on their credit. So, but there were probably a hundred blogs after people found out that I was making good money. And then they all came for me, not all of them, but a lot of them, I remember the one would be like, uh, and it's funny, it's a website, my parent company ended up acquiring years later <laughs> and is now shut down. Um, but he was doing a whole thing. Oh, I'm the true, uh, I'm the true, uh, I'm only for my readers. Um, and then he did a poll, should I monetize? Like. <laughs> And I'm like, the whole time I'm thinking, dude, you're going to take the money. This is such a charade, you <laughs> right. know, like, shut up, take the money. And guess what? We can all win. You know, yeah. and I think a lot of other influencers and content creators will see like when other people try to put you down just to justify to themselves that they're worthwhile. My take has always been like, and I love competition. Mm -hmm. Good. Like there's plenty of room to grow. Like, yeah. you know, like the addressable market is huge in the United States, like yeah. and global like but it was funny, yeah. And he did a poll, the points guy, is he still credible after taking money? <laughs> wow. And oh, this and very that. specific. And it's just how funny. And another lesson I will give to people is you never know. So years later, my parent company ended up purchasing his blog and then his blog uh ended up getting rolled into the points guy. Mm. And it, you know, so you, you, you just want to be careful what, what uh, bridges you burn early in your career because you might get instant gratification, but strategic people who last a long time in this business know that choose your battles wisely and it's better to win by focusing on yourself and your mm -hmm. brand. As Beyonce once said, the, the best revenge is your paper. You know, <laughs> like it's just a bad look to kind of attack others. And yeah. I think no matter what industry you're in, people can relate to that. What about you? Have you had, you know, your share of others in the industry like jealous or Um, I don't know about jealous, but I would say we definitely have a lot of imitators. Yeah. Um which uh clearly you have had as yeah. well. But I feel like what you just shared, there's so many lessons there, right? One is like you said, obviously don't burn bridges. Mm -hmm. You never know where people are going to end up. And also what I really think is another really important lesson is be transparent with your audience. Yeah. Like that's another thing that really drives me crazy, especially about this sort of travel space that we're in. There are so many undisclosed relationships, yep. uh, whether it's like paid or people are getting hosted. Like there's a lot of just like pretending that, oh, I'm just here. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, I think your audience is always going to respect it more. Yeah if you're clear about the relationship, just like, you know, yeah. with affiliate links early on for you, they knew that they understood that if I click on this link, yeah. Brian gets a cut. And those who did it were doing so willingly as sort of almost like a tip jar situation, yeah. right? They got value out of what you do. So they're like, yeah, why not kick him a few bucks? Like he saved me thousands of dollars on this trip. Um, and I, it's, it's interesting that like even to today, that sort of like, transparency factor is still not as prevalent as yeah. I would imagine. Well, I think you've been a good example. I was laughing reading the comments the other day about people saying, well, when you're hosted and you don't like the food, you'll say, well, you know, this is a chair, you know, like there are ways to- <laughs> I think, I think the ways, quote was, yeah. the chairs are chairing. <laughs> <laughs> yes. 
But I think that proves a great point that you don't have to fully endorse everything. In fact, when yeah. you overly endorse everything, your credibility goes down. Yeah. People are smart. You yeah. know, like your audience, especially in travel, like you have to say, you know, whether you're fashion or travel, like people only get to travel often once a year, right? Yeah. And they really need to know, like, what is the experience I'm going to get? Yeah. And I will say this, so I'm known and I'll give criticism. And a lot of times, you know, now most airline executives follow me. So when I am critical, like people notice, but I will tell you this, you know, there's a certain airline that has just a horrible food, uh, United, I'll just say, because <laughs> I'm very public about it. I love United. United has a great culture. I know the senior execs, the, they have new planes. They've got so many good things going, but United has been naughty with their catering. They outsourced it and they cut it to the bottom line. And I know oh how these God. decisions I, I was make. literally just on a United flight like two weeks ago. And it's and sad. It's, it's and terrible. The, so the flight attendants, every flight, the flight attendants apologize. <laughs> They're embarrassed. So I was coming home last year and I just said, I, uh, officially United has given up that I got chicken tikka masala and it, it there was no red sauce on. I mean it was just rice wow. and dry chicken and long story short there was a catering issue doesn't but it proves the point so I, I just wrote officially like today's the day like United no longer cares about what they're serving on their plane and I went to bed on the plane and I wake up to a handwritten note from the captain the flight attendant comes up high fives me she goes oh you got someone's attention <laughs> apparently this like CEO's office called the in, the pilots in flight. Wow! To see While was, the flight is happening, and then I would landed at Newark, and there were all these people for Mr. Kelly. What I'm like, I didn't swallow glass. Don't worry, <laughs> it's not that serious. Yeah. But even senior executives at the company were will always say thank you for saying that because mm -hmm. we've been in those meetings with senior executives who say, oh, we don't care about food. You know, as long as people have a nice life lap bed, they don't care. They don't mm -hmm. care. So giving good constructive feedback, it's not. I think so many of us were raised where that's like impolite to do that, mm. myself included. It's taken me a long time. And certainly as a content creator, you don't want to burn bridges, right? Yep. So what's the balance of let's not burn a bridge, but let's be authentic. And I think if you do, if you do anything in a constructive way, like I love this resort so much for these reasons, and it would be a slam dunk if yep. this buffet had more vegan options or healthy options, everything was, you know, there was a lot of cream, you, you know, like, mm -hmm. Instead of just saying it's horrible, but by giving like, you know, and especially if you have the experience, like I've been around all these resorts in the Caribbean and, you know, like, so just giving and people will read through the line. You don't have to slam it, yeah. you know, because and truly like brands don't want to work with problem child mm -hmm. content creators. So it is a fine line. But I think everyone likes constructive feedback um, because you giving that feedback will actually help the resort improve. Mm -hmm. And as much as people say, well, like, just do it privately. Yeah, yeah, you can do it privately, but also like you do have something that you owe your audience, right? Yeah. Because yeah. think about it, your your audience, the person who gets that one vacation a year, and then if you say everything's perfect, and then they lose, then you're losing your currency. So yeah. you have to think, okay, I got the hosted trip or a small contract, but like if I start losing currency, it's a slippery slope and people talk and you know, so that's, I think the part of the equation not enough content creators think about it's the brands and this and that and you're so focused on that but you got to have to have a long career you have to balance both yeah and I think it is absolutely possible to do it like absolutely you said. yeah um, I think too many creators think that it's you either serve one yep. side or you serve the other you can't do both but you absolutely, absolutely. can do both and it's like yeah Deliver your critique, but if it is a hosted situation or a sponsored situation, yeah. do it diplomatically. Do it diplomatically and give a heads up before your content yes. goes live, like to the, all the people involved. No one likes to be caught flat footed. Yep. You know, transparency is key. So you can give them a heads up. Like, you know, I'm not going to share with you my final content. I don't know what the contract rules are, but like here, are the every review I do, I always have to have ways it could improve because there's no perfect resort in the world. Yeah. This is what I'm going to say for your resort. You know, what do they call it? A shit sandwich. Start good, <laughs> give feedback, end good, right? Right, right, you know? right. And I would also add to that if there is any type of a specific problem that happens during a trip or during a stay, let your client know and give them the mm -hmm. opportunity to uh, fix it first. Yeah. Like, so this is it, like in situations where they gave you the wrong room or, you yeah. know, something specific, not just like, because oh, you the do food want to include good. the service recovery in there. Yes, you exactly. Know? It could be a great opportunity to showcase how they turned it around. Correct. Yeah. yeah. And I, I will admit I'm guilty. Sometimes I'm just being too <laughs> tired and I'm like, well, 
but <laughs> we're, no one's perfect. No, no, definitely not. How would you like to win a free trip to New York, explore this amazing city, and join us right here in the studio as our special guest? We're celebrating the launch of this podcast with a spectacular giveaway. Woohoo! We are going to be flying one lucky creator out to New York for the weekend. Think of it like a brand trip. You'll get to hang out with us. We'll talk shop about the business of influence and content creation. And we'll make sure that you capture plenty of New York City content. So that way you're ready to propel your creator career. And we'll even feature you on a special bonus episode as a guest on the podcast. To find out how to enter the giveaway, just click the link in the description below. But hurry, because the giveaway closes December 31st, 2023. So get your entry in as soon as possible. Good luck. Back to the blog. You kind of somewhat stumbled into this wonderful world of affiliate marketing, yeah. and that completely changed the game. Um, so at that point, was that the majority or almost all of the monetization yeah. or were you exploring other business models at the same time? So, so there were three main, so started off, it was the award booking business. And that was like a couple hundred bucks a month to like a thousand. I think one month I made 2000 doing, and I was working like a dog, Yeah, that's a but lot I was of hours. like 2000 in cash was a lot of money for someone who was living paycheck to paycheck. That that allowed me to start going out to dinners where I wasn't panicked when it would be like, everyone split the bill, you yeah. know? like. Then I had the Google AdSense on, which mm. you know was a couple hundred dollars a month once I started getting to fifty thousand monthly uniques or whatever. So it was like you know a rounding, and then the affiliate. So the affiliate was just wild. March of twenty eleven, I get into Rakuten. I think Chase was the only one that approved me at first, and um, they had a United card, a British Airways card. I made five thousand bucks that first month literally not knowing what I was doing. I didn't even go back into old posts. I was mm. just starting to use links. Um, so I was like, wow, this is now almost annualized, like what my salary is at the bank. Um, I was like, I need to pay more attention to this. So <laughs> like, um, but April of 2011 was the year. I mean, I, it was a wild, wild, uh, the month that changed my life. So I'm in affiliate marketing and I'm starting to get the hang that like the more I write, and the more like you know links there are, the more clicks. The more clicks mm -hmm. is the more money you make. But what really launched the Point Sky and to this day, and why I'm still there is media and learning how to leverage media, traditional media, um, especially to launch the brand. So another nugget I have for my influencers out there, or people just starting their business. Look through your spam inbox. Mm -hmm. I remember I was looking through the Points Guy Gmail was our original account. And I was visiting a friend in Spain and I was having a glass of wine while I was waiting for her to get ready. And I go into my spam box and just scrolling through and I just remember it. Oh my God, my heart dropped. And interview request New York Times. Mm. And it was Seth Kugel who uh, at the time was prolific. He, he ran the Frugal Traveler column at the New York Times travel section, which was huge. The and he was all about travel deals, budget travelers. And he basically was like, hey, look, I keep hearing about this Point Sky thing. Um, I've always told my huge audience, don't pay attention to frequent flyer miles. And you know they're useless, blackout dates, yada, yada, yada. And I just remember being like, Seth, with all due respect, you couldn't be further off from the truth. Budget travelers of anyone need to save money and points can make you travel more. So I said, meet me. In New York, we met at a bar for three hours. I changed the way he thought. I mean, because points and miles, it's it's not couponing, it's a language, right? Yeah. And once you start learning that language, it unlocks. And that's the joy. And that's frankly still why I'm at the point while I'm at the points. Guy, I uh, I thrive off of when people's eyes light up and they're like, because of your content, I have traveled to see family in Vietnam. You know, I was in medical school and broke as a resident and the only reason I'm married today is because my you know, fiance and I each got credit cards and that's how we were flying. Yeah. There's no greater joy to me. So he was a journalist for the New York Times making not a lot of money, yeah. but he loved to travel and he had a girlfriend in Brazil. So that day I taught him how to use his points and re he realized his current points could get him a trip to Brazil. And he on his budget was only like once or twice a year he went there. So that day he booked a free trip to Brazil to surprise his girlfriend. Wow. And he was like, I cannot believe, he's like, this is like winning the lottery. Yeah. I get to see my girlfriend sooner. And I said, that my friend is the power of points. Like this, is, you had this existing, but like you mind your knowledge mm -hmm. due to me, you know? Yeah. <laughs> but like, and now you get to see her. So 
Several weeks went by. I didn't know if he was going to write an article or not. And at the same time, Chase, my main client, I got rumors that there was going to be a 100,000 point offer on the British Airways card. Mm. Not the Sapphire. That would come years yeah. later. <laughs> um, but I got. I was like, oh my God, this will be major. Because at the point sky, like then, so flyer talk was still a thing, but it was still very cryptic, very in the toxic community. And they did not like newcomers. So basically, and that's why a lot of people in the points world dislike me is because I've shared the secrets mm. with the world. You know, best wishes to them, but you know, you're not my, uh, you know, I, I got a thick skin very quickly, yeah. but people were very, you know, when you start spoiling deals. But um, so this 100,000 point British Airways offer was coming and I was like, oh my God, this is gonna be amazing because there'd never been a 100,000 point offer. I'm like, I'm gonna do a lot of business because, you know, British Airways has huge fees when you go to London, but in 2011, the British Airways program, you could go, it was like New York to Miami, like eight round trips with that 100,000. 100, it wow. was crazy. You could go to Easter Island, you know. So it happens. I get an email from Chase, oh, exclusively launching today. And it was like, I don't know, $200 per approval or something like that. And I'm like, I'm gonna sell a thousand of these cards. And I remember thinking to myself, I'm gonna make 200,000 off this deal. So I wake up, I take off from Morgan Stanley, this is April 15th or something, and I get my post up and it starts going viral. Like, cause I explain to people, don't go to London, here are all the ways. Uh, if you live in LA, you can go to Hawaii. You get four round trips to Hawaii yeah. for the 100,000. So four round trips for an LA family from one credit card sign up. People were sending it to their whole families and then 11 a.m. the site shuts down because the New York Times posted that same day the Points Guy, the number one travel website everyone needs to know about. Wow. So unbeknownst to me, that link back was gold that would pay off for years to come because a New York Times link back to an up and coming blog was still is very important SEO wise. Yeah. But then it just went bonkers. I mean, I think I did the math. I think that day, I didn't end up finding out because clicks, it took a week or so to get the links back. But I think I made 130,000 that day. Wow. I was like starting to do the math and conversion. I'm like, I think I'm rich. <laughs> and the next day I went into Morgan Stanley and quit. So that was like nine months after blogging. Wow. I ended up staying until June because my mom was panicked about me having <laughs> health benefits. And there was like a net 90 pay in the affiliate marketing company. I was like, is this money ever going to come? Oh, like on yeah. paper, I was in the affiliate portal like, I would. I was. It was a very weird time. I. I. I never took investment money for the points guy, but I did take a ten thousand dollar loan from my parents just to pay rent and stuff. I, yeah. My mom was like, Brian, I hate to tell you, it's, if it's too good to be true, it is. And I'm like, No, I think I'm rich actually. <laughs> Those um, payment terms will get you every time. But we I remember. Trust me, I remember where I was when that that direct deposit went, the six figure direct deposit, and it was so from beginning affiliate marketing, it was six months till I made a million dollars. Wow. In 2011. So that's incredible. It was it was like winning the lottery. Yeah. Um, life changing. And that was just the beginning. Yeah. Um, so, I, you know, I started hiring a couple people. And then in 2012, a friend of mine, uh, another tip for people. Actually, I had went on a date with this guy. We ended up just becoming friends, but he was big in uh, the digital media world. So stay friends with your exes where possible. <laughs> Because for me, it changed my life. I stayed friends with him and he said, well, I have this uh, friend, Tom. He's the CEO of a company called Bankrate. It's a publicly traded company. They own bankrate.com, which is a big personal finance, creditcards.com, which was the biggest credit cards website, and a bunch of others. And he wants to meet with you. And I remember I flew home on Cathay Pacific first class from a, you know, I'm 27 with making 500 grand a month, you know, with like, wow. 4,000 in expenses, you know, like it, I had some contributors, but it was, I was living the life yeah. and I didn't, I was like, I'm not gonna sell. I left Morgan Stanley so I would never have to work for the man again, you know? Mm -hmm. But um, there were so many imposters. That's when the gold rush happened where there's hundreds of like points blogs and they were all coming for me. And I was like relatively confident in my ability to navigate it. But my biggest concern was that all these people were gaming the system and that the credit card companies would cut it off because yeah. they're like, it. Because creators get greedy and then people are saying, cancel your credit cards. You know, I'm like, stop biting the hand that feeds us. You yeah. know, I could control what I did, but there were a lot of lunatics. And I'm like, they're gonna ruin this. And lo and behold, this guy Tom, I meet with him, and he the next day he's like, I want to buy your website. This was April of 2011. So not even, you know, it's been a year since I started making money. Um, 
never had any plans to sell. And over the next six weeks, I didn't even have a banker, a, a banker to help. I had a team of attorneys, which was great. I didn't have to pay bankers to sell. And me to Tom, to Tom we one on one. I sold the you know we went through six weeks of negotiations, due diligence. Wild, but it was like Memorial Day 2012. I sold the site and um, had a three and a half year earnout. Of course, they were like not going to give the point sky everything because I'd just walk mm -hmm. away. So they kept me in as an earnout, and then the business just kept growing. And um, so I negotiated a deal where it made sense for me to keep to see upside in the business, even though I didn't own the point sky. Yeah, we and still to this day, I have a deal with our parent, new parent company in 27, that publicly traded company was bought. So all my stock then, so it's almost like I feel like I've sold the point sky twice, mm -hmm. did two different integrations, which come with its own set of, you know, so it's been a very wild journey. I would say it's very unique for a founder to stay three years, let alone, I'm now at 11 years post sale. Wow. And frankly, the happiest I've ever been because I've been able to, I know uh, in 2020, I realized being CEO, managing a hundred people in different countries was not my expertise. The pandemic helped me take a breather, think about what I want in my actual life, not yeah. just focus on work, work, work and traveling. And I do believe travel can be an addiction that, oh, yeah. especially when you're in a travel creator and it's free and you have that wanderlust, okay, I'm gonna spend this fall at home and then, oh, but wait, I love Iceland <laughs> and this is a cool, you know, the FOMO, the, yeah. But 2020 was the year that changed my life and that it was like, stay home. I didn't travel, got a clear mind. And that's when I realized I wanted to be a dad. Mm. So I now have a, a 14 month old son and I realized I didn't want to manage teams. That's not my expertise. My expertise is being the content creator, going out, speaking to consumers, doing press. And my parent company is like, good, do that. Do all the things you're great at doing. Yeah, There are plenty of people who can manage, so. That's amazing. Well. I definitely want to talk about Dean. Yeah. But what does it feel like to sell your blog for twenty million dollars? Um, is what I've heard rumored. <laughs> it's it was a life changing sum of money. Um, a little bit more than that. Oh, okay. And it was an earnout, so I had to like you know over three and a half years like hustle to get that. But it was yeah. I mean, in June of twenty ten. And sorry if you don't mind me asking, earnout. Earnout means Meaning yeah, just like you'll get a huge chunk do... at the sale, but then yeah. every year the business has to grow a certain amount for I you see. to get the. So, you so they want your goals. skin in the game. I mean, I sold the business on a Friday, and I was hustling that weekend because I was already <laughs> like, I got a you know, I had twenty twelve goals to hit, and yeah. You know. So it was amazing in that I had enough money where, and all my entrepreneur friends were like, take it, take the deal, and I did. I feel very strongly. At the time, knowing what I knew, it was amazing to take the money off the table. That yeah. if the whole thing, it gave me peace of mind where if everything blew up, I would not have to work for a while. I could invest, figure out what I want to do. So, um, so yeah, I mean, looking back now, yeah, if I would have kept the site, I would have, you know, sold for many, many, many times that. But I, also just don't, I'm not a backwards looker. I don't mm -hmm. sit and regret often. It's like I make decisions, they happen for a reason. My life has been blessed in so many ways. And frankly, like being a part of a publicly traded company allowed them to handle all the HR, legal, office, you know, like they handled that and I, they let me just focus on creative. And I hired yeah. a bunch of really smart people. And I do look so fondly back at those early days. That we, you know, we were in a WeWork, a bigger WeWork. <laughs> and then we finally got our big headquarters on Park Avenue where we had Frenchies running around. It was real. It was a really fun time. Yeah. And, you know, selling to a company brings a different amount of stresses. You've now all of a sudden, I went from freewheeling 27-year-old with a six-figure <laughs> checking account doing whatever I wanted to, you know, I, I had to, you know, get approvals for certain things. But... Yeah. You know, it was it was life changing. It really was incredible. And n knowing what I know now, I think for years I went through imposter syndrome for mm. sure, where I'm like, this was my I'm a one trick pony. Mm. This is you know I got lucky, right time, right place. You know, I told myself that all so much. And now, and what I would encourage anyone who's going through, and so many people these days have meteoric rises. You know, yeah. it's like I have so many of my friends now who are top content creators from the pandemic who mm -hmm. right time, right place, millions of TikTok followers. I 
would urge everyone, I probably should have gone to therapy earlier. Mm. When your life changes that dramatically, it's not just like your online persona, but then it bleeds into your personal life too. I mean, I will be honest, there were the dynamic shift with my siblings yeah. was interesting. And, and if you don't mind me asking, what's where are you in the birth order? So I'm one of four. So I have two older brothers who are amazing. They're yeah. um, One's a lawyer, one's a... Um, accountant and we're really really close and I have a younger sister mm. um so I'm the third I'm the middle child but inter you know like and they've all been very supportive but it just it really does change things yeah. um you know when you start dating when you start having a level of notoriety it does go to your head you know in certain ways you probably don't even realize so dating people to this day I'm single and 40 had great relationships but dating now is its own bag of you know people will come up to me at a restaurant and it can either make people uncomfortable mm -hmm. like it, it you cannot deny the fact you know and you'll say to yourself oh it's just that's not me though this is the it's very difficult to separate digital personas and yeah. personal um so I would recommend to anyone who's going through that to get a really good therapist and see them, you know, weekly or bi-weekly to help just process because yeah. I think the mistake I made was just assuming that and I was so hell bent on I'm going to keep all my existing friends because I'm going to prove that I haven't changed. Mm -hmm. And you know, as you get older you realize like there are certain friends that kind of need to leave, right? And mm -hmm. there are certain friends who are jealous and or going through their own journey and you know uh cutting cutting friends or making space for new friends that support you is really a part of the process and yeah. people will tell you oh you've let it go to your head but you know there you know so i think that there, there's a lot that that went through it and i didn't have a therapist and i probably just traveled and partied a little bit just to like kind of numb it yeah but um, but yeah, I mean, it's an ex it's been an extraordinary journey. And that's what I say to myself all the time. Like, you know, you'll make mistakes, you know, it's but even just the financial side of things. I mean, I went from having no money and to being, you know, my first relationship, my my ex had money and I was broke and it was a power struggle. Right. Mm -hmm. Like I didn't have a say. And that's when all of a sudden I had I got money. This relationship I thought I was going to be in forever. It actually changed that dynamic overnight. Wow. I was like, I want to be independent. I've never experienced this. So, um, yeah, I mean, it changes your life in so many different ways. And and as the face of the brand, it's pressure, you know, mm. like. And then uh, the more employees you have, the more agents and the more people who are living off of you and what you put out there is more pressure than I think a lot of creators like to. Everyone thinks they can do it with a brave face. I'm the same person. I'm ready for this. But no one is ready for that meteoric rise. And um, I've always been curious about this. Was there ever at any point talk of changing the name, The Points Guy? Because it's you are The Points totally. Guy, Totally. Right? And funny enough, when I started the site, a lot of people were like, you'll never be able to grow a brand called The Points Guy. I remember people saying it's, and it's still to this day when people don't know the site, they're like, Sky? The Points Sky? Like, <laughs> SK? I'm like, G-U-I. They're like, oh, are you The Points Guy? I'm like, yes, but they're... But I'm so, not the only one. <laughs> yeah, so what I'll say is this. I would not be offended if they changed the name. A lot of people call it TPG. Yep. And, you know, we call it TPG, The Points Guy. So recently, Scott's Cheap Flights changed to Going.com. Yes. And... I think that has created challenges in the SEO space. Mm. But when you build brand knowledge, like you generally don't want to. I mean, certainly there have been rebrands that have been successful. Um, I'm no, no longer the one making those decisions. I think people now realize we actually have more females working for the company than men. Mm -hmm. um, I think the consumer. I don't know. I think if it if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Is what my personal take would be. Yeah. I don't think people need to be told. Huffington Post, people knew Ariana wasn't the one cranking away. You <laughs> right, know, like, right. there, yeah, there have been talks and discussions, but I, I would caution any drastic changes to something that's working. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, you went from you running the whole show to obviously selling the blog, and then now there's a lot of other parties involved. Yeah. How did that feel, sort of having to maybe give up a little bit of control um, after it being your baby for yeah. so long? 
Because so, I'm a big control freak. That's why I'm yes. asking the question. Oh, I mean, well, that, I mean, I remember even just bringing on contributors in the yeah. beginning was like, I mean, it's skin crawl, right? Because my <laughs> name's on this. And I mean, anytime you scale a business, you have to release control because you cannot physically do everything to the best of your ability. And I think yeah. any good entrepreneur will realize, let me, st you know, you have only a certain amount of time in the day, you know, and I learned, you know, early, I, I'm not that much of a control freak in that. You know, even just personally, like I got housekeepers early on. I hate that shit. I, yeah. or, you know, like let me just get as much of my day that I can use and, and align to what I want to do. Um, but it was challenging. I mean, I went through two corporate integrations. So I sold and then Bankrate bought our company. And Bankrate was very hands off. Bankrate, because we were so profitable. And the points guy has been a cash cow from the beginning. And, mm -hmm. you know, barring 2020 when there was that blip, it's been a very profitable company. So Bankrate's take was Brian and his team of French bulldogs and writers <laughs> down on Wall Street, you know, leave them alone. And mm -hmm. I didn't find out till years later, they even told board members, like, don't bother them. Wow. Because we're growing, growing, growing and becoming this cultural phenomenon. And they didn't, you know, and I told them too, I'm not moving to the Madison Ave stuffy office. <laughs> like, no, no, no. And they were like, good, you don't have to just keep making money, yeah. you know? So in a way that was easy because, you know, they would support us. I wanted to build a beautiful headquarters on Park Ave. They got us the best architects they let me design the whole thing do crazy things like buy concord chairs off the internet <laughs> but yeah i mean over the years you have to hiring is the most important thing you have to do and i you know I, once again i don't look back and you know i hired a lot of good people in digital marketing um and in media some were good fits some were not yeah some were spectacular failures and and I, was your hr experience Helpful it came in that? helpful, but what I've realized too is anyone can ace an interview. Yeah, it's so like, and yeah. what I it's so hard because, and sometimes the most charismatic people who worked at the best company, you're yep. like, yes, this is such a slam dunk. Yeah, but then they come on and they're just really not cultural fits, or re it's it's hiring is the hardest thing, yep. especially now in this digital age where you hop on a Zoom with someone. You know, you hear from a friend of a friend, they're amazing and they work for this company that's totally blowing up in social, you know, but mm -hmm. it's like until you get those people in it. So I would push people to like much more practical execution, like in interviews. I used to just be like, oh, you worked at Refinery29 and social. They're the moment. They're doing great. You must be great. You know, like. Mm -hmm. And then, but practically, that person wasn't even involved in the day-to-day -day content creation. So the task that I wanted them for was not a fit. Mm. You know, we didn't have budget to hire a bunch of other people. So I, instead of that one expensive senior hire, I should have had two creatives. Yeah. And there were a lot of times where I'm like, oh, I mishired the level or, you know, I wanted to just have someone to just handle it all. But at the end of the day, like I had a vision for what our social wanted to be. Like I should have just hired the creatives that I... So testing them, you know, test, you know, writers, testing writers, you know, give them a writing sample. See, how, you know, yes, anyone on the social team, show me now in this meeting, like, here's a raw clip. What's something really clever you can do with this in like five minutes? I'll be, you know, like yeah. that type of practical where possible. Some roles, it's hard to, you know, leadership roles, right. like, you know, here's a Christ. Well, actually, no, I mean, there's a lot of, I would just push for more, less of, um, you know, the paper resume mm -hmm. where they were because you don't and, and then really digging in trying to get those re, it's hard to get referrals on people it's depending on state laws and whatnot but in any case yes is it it's challenging to give up control and i i think i was a way too controlling ceo you know i look back and we were super successful um but i know there were definitely times when i was short-tempered with staff and like was not my best self because i was also i mean from my perspective i'm in front of the camera being the face of the brand i'm behind the camera managing the tech you know and teams and then also our clients and also our parent company yeah so there were just i was unrealistic in the capacity that i had to do it all and i am just very happy now if i did it all again there were a lot of things i would change but but i'm very happy now being in a role where i have no direct employees and I can do stuff like today um, <laughs> on a random Tuesday and a lot of our charity yeah and a, and a lot of our charity work too which is very important to me yeah so how did your role evolve so it sounds like in the beginning you were you know full-on CEO and yeah. then over time yeah I was basically CEO up until 2020 because even when we sold the bank rate in 2012 I mean I had a boss who I talked to once a month making sure things you know 
they would approve like big hires and stuff like that. But like in general, even my expense report, as long as it was like under a hundred thousand a month, mm -hmm. he was fine. You know, like it was very much like just you're making money. Okay, just keep go keep doing it. Um, and then when we got acquired by Red Ventures in 2017, it was the polar opposite where they got very involved. But it was great because I actually was craving at that point. Our parent company was so not involved. I didn't even have a tech team. I didn't have an SEO team. Mm. We were just a bunch of creators writing really rich content that was monetizing like crazy. Yeah. But we didn't really have the behind the scenes infrastructure, reporting, data teams, et cetera. Yeah. So much of building a successful online brand is data these, you know. Yeah. So I'm thankful Red Ventures came in and they were powerhouses in digital marketing. So they revolutionized our business, you know, structurally. I had a much more active kind of overseer. He was not involved in the day to day. He was like, he's like, I don't know the points. You know, like he's like, I don't know how to, but he would give very strategic leadership advice to me. And, you know, so I learned a ton. I still continue to learn a ton. That's why I'm still at Red Ventures because they're a really smart company of smart people. So you've got to be open to it. Um, but so they got very involved in that. I mean, they took our business to the next level too. So we finally came out with our app and tools and we bought Lonely Planet and all these other interesting acquisitions. We now own CNET and a bunch of other sites. So we're able to now learn from across a huge spectrum of, of digital sites. And also being a part, they're very successful. So even when 2020 hit and the points guy was down, many of our other portfolio companies shot up. Mm. So that's why having a diversified parent company is actually really nice where yeah. I never really lost sleep during the pandemic because, you know, they and we didn't really even have to lay people off. Mm. So we're one of the very few digital media companies that didn't made no layoffs, you know, throughout the peak of the pandemic. Yeah. So I feel like you have really sort of transcended the what we typically think of as like a creator or an influencer and i'm kind of curious like where do you see yourself yeah. fitting in because there's all these different intersecting well i look at myself now industries. i'm like i'm the worst influencer because <laughs> um and that's actually something i i want to my personal brand so i own brian kelly obviously and i'm gonna do a book which i'm really excited Ooh. about written by myself so i mean Am I still an influencer for sure? But I mean, I think first and foremost, I'm an entrepreneur who started a business, saw an idea, built it into something, you know, amazing. I'm very proud of. And also, you know, in the pandemic, I started investing in other companies too. So I kind of was grounded and I got approached. I've been approached by a lot of really fascinating startups. So I don't want to ever be the founder again where I'm hustling, hustling, hustling like crazy. Yeah. I have a son now and I love the peace that I've created in my life. And I am loved that I did it myself and hustled and built something. But now I like to invest in other people who have that energy and great yeah. ideas. Um, and I was lucky enough to get involved with Built, which is now, um, for those who don't know, it's the only credit card you earn points on rent with no annual fee, no fees to pay your rent. Um, and it's now much more, it's much more than a credit card. It's a whole loyalty platform. And there are a lot of apartment buildings now that are built buildings where you pay your rent through. We've got a lot of other exciting things happening. That's the quickest startup to ever get to a billion dollar valuation. And I got in at the very beginning oh. as an advisor. And then I put my own money in. So I now kind of have taken a lot of my earnings as a creator. I have my own little fund because I get it, you know, through friends. I mean, I get a really good deal flow of companies that I believe strongly in, mm -hmm. in and around credit cards. Some are not even in the field. So I look at myself now as an investor, as an entrepreneur, um, and an influencer third, I would say. Yeah. But I do think I, I have a lot to say, and I think I just need, I'm going to hire a clever social person to work for me personally, mm. because I, I have a lot of reactions and stuff, but I just get, you know, I don't have the you know, and I don't want to compete with the young and upcoming people in the points world that are doing just points content. I, you know, I have got like a different, I have like a larger platform I want to share and I want to get my social numbers up for when my book comes out. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm speaking more regularly to that audience. So I give kudos to creators like you who constantly <laughs> evolve and are cranking out content in all different formats. Yeah. So, well, I'm curious. Um, you know, I feel like some creators are very much like just pure information, right? And certainly, you know, TPG in the early days, there was a lot of that. It's like practical how to use points to maximize your travel. Um, and then some creators are very much 
they're bearing their whole lives online. Yeah. Um, and then there's a lot in between. I'm kind of curious now as the sort of personal brand, yeah. Brian Kelly, where do you see yourself well, falling in that spectrum? It's interesting because I do believe what made the points, you know, so there were a ton of other, I wasn't the first points blogger. Yeah. You know, there, there were many others for years before me. I was the first one to monetize it to the extent that I have. But I do believe a big portion of that, so press was a big piece of it, but it was also showing a little bit of my life and letting people know who I am. And I do share who I am. And I believe that does help. Like we live in the Kardashian era, right? <laughs> like reality TV yeah. and people connect with brands and founders. And you've seen so many founders who share, can build a deep connection with their consumer. And that's really valuable. So. And most of my other competitors were very clinical and mm. they're much smarter points people than me for sure. But for example, they would have flight reviews for years and you never once saw a picture of them. You never saw right. a human enjoying. And me being six, seven, I think people immediately <laughs> were like, well, if Brian can fit in that business class seat. We're gonna be great, yeah. you know? So, but more of it was like getting to know me as a person. And I do believe building a personal brand where people sort of like me and wanna hang out with me has been invaluable because when I go to credit card companies and I'm taking selfies on my way to the meeting and in pretty much every meeting I go to, oh, my husband or every, not every, I've been to major uh, TV shows where I'm in the green room ready to go on air with an iconic host and the producer comes down and has, is like, oh my God, my husband's the biggest fan. <laughs> I have presidents and you know A-list celebrities, but like you in here, and the bookers are hearing that, right? And that's yeah. like, and that helps me get booked again. So I think, well, I know from my personal experience, and I don't share nearly as much as a lot of influencers, but leave, letting people know who you are, everyone's nosy. I mm -hmm. mean, human race is nosy. We wanna know. Um, so yeah, I think I'm always now, especially being a dad, you, I mean, what to share about, you know, safety, privacy, it's now as complex as ever yeah. um, because I'm so proud of my son and he brings so much joy to people. He is a character and he's the cutest, happiest. He is this like ray of light. Um, and luckily my audience, knock on wood, is like very, I only have to block people once every couple months. Like that's how, like I'm, it's generally a very elevated, positive audience. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, I, I struggle with that a little bit, but I think deep down, um, you know, letting people know who you are is good for business. Yeah. And has that ever been challenging? And I'm going to get a little nosy. Yeah, Speaking I of get being nosy, nosy um, I know that you had a pretty public like proposal yes. a few years back. And presumably, I don't know all the details, yeah. but presumably that relationship didn't work out. Yeah. No, we, I proposed that... in December and we broke up in March. Yeah. Um, and how was that sort of living that well, somewhat publicly? Well, it's interesting because I, I had a recent breakup as well. And it's like how I would never talk negatively about any ex and I wouldn't even tell details. But when you bring people in and share details, sometimes they're like, well, then what happened? Yeah. And I don't feel the need to respond to that. And I think most normal people are like, there's no way he's going to get on here and put people on blast. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's a little bit challenging. Um but not really. I mean, at the end of the day, I will share what I, in my sites, you know, my Instagram's free. I don't, you know, when people complain about something, I'm like, well, then ask for a refund. <laughs> you know, like, you know, it is challenging. I, you know, friendships, I've had really close friendships that I share and I travel the world with these people. And then when things happen, you know, it's annoying more than anything when people are like, well, what happened to so-and-so? And I'm like, well, I can't tell you. It's not what you, th you know, but so sometimes it's like, but I, I know once again, if people know who I am as a person and, you know, life is challenging, but you don't have to share every single moment. Yeah. Yeah. But, and I think that's a great tip as yeah. a creator. You decide, yeah. right? You decide where to draw the boundaries. Yeah. And like you said, it's, they can ask for a refund. They can, yeah. <laughs> they, you, and people can ask questions. You can feel free, you know, what you're responding with, but no one, you know. I would. It is tough though dating non-public people mm -hmm. who don't ask necessarily to be a part of this, and you certainly don't want to create a reputation for yourself. I mean, I guess it's worked for Taylor Swift and creating <laughs> so many popular songs about her exes, but in general, you know, you don't want to. It's hard enough dating an influencer, yeah, and all that comes with it. Let alone having you don't want any partner to be like in the back of your head. Well, oh crap, like this could be put on blast, or mm -hmm. I could be made to look, and vice versa. Mm -hmm. Have good NDAs, people. 
<laughs> Definitely. Uh, yeah. Well, but now you're a dad. Yes. Um, your life has obviously changed a lot. Um, how has becoming a father kind of changed, I guess, your work life? I mean, it yeah. sounds like those two things kind of went hand in hand. Like you're yeah, reforming thoughts about career. Yeah, so supportive. And I, I, mean, I took three months off for paternity. That was the first time I'd taken off work in... I don't know, two decades almost, wow. you know, like really, because even when I travel, it's still kind yes. of work in a way, even yeah. when it's a personal trip, you know, there's no such thing. Always feel like I'm somewhat working or so it was so beautiful. You know, my son was born in October to just have the fall off on my farm and take walks, reset and just look at him. And, you know, any new parent knows you just like stare at this yeah. thing you've created every single thing they do. And on the other hand, just hoping what, what can I do to make sure they don't die? You know, like they're, they're so fragile. Keep them alive. Yeah. Being a dad to me, I think in general has helped highlight the opportunity cost of bullshit, mm. you know, like whether it's friendships or I've made some cuts, a lot of like substantial cuts in my life. And it's set me free because I have, you know, there are friends in my life that were fun years ago, but like now that I have a child, there's behavior that like, it's just not acceptable. And, it's nothing personal, but like you can do that elsewhere. You cannot be in my orbit um, because, you know, I am a bullet. You know, your your children pick up. I mean, my son's only 13 months and he's picking up stuff. They absorb the people around them. And so I think it's it's also helped me realize, like, I don't want to go to events. You know, like the, a lot of the BS stuff, like, you know, I really want to have intention behind what I do and yeah. the trips that I take. And. Um, I do feel immense guilt. You know, I do know I'm a single working father. And so I do have to work in the lifestyle. But, you know, so balancing like when I you know it's been somewhat easy if I have to take trips like Greenland was an incredible opportunity. I may be working with Swan Hellenic, which is a really fabulous expedition company. Martha is a great friend, but like there was no business bringing a one year old <laughs> on a cruise to Greenland with stormy seas. Right. Yeah. Like half the ship got sick. I can't even and they were going to let me. And I'm like. I almost did it just because I'm like, oh, well, he'll just hang in my cabin. <laughs> Dumbest idea. That would have been the most moronic. But like being away for a week, it is it is stressful, especially as he's older now and he wakes up every morning, dad, 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 dad. And we have our playtime. So it's like after seven days of without him, it, it is challenging. But it's also given me more of like a you know reason to live in a certain way. You know, like start, you know, the points guy is not my end all be all. Like mm -hmm. I'm proud of that and I'm passionate about it. And having a child has just kind of like reignited this passion for life. And it actually has reignited me to work harder on the points guy to finally write a book, potentially pursue a TV show, all of these things that I think, I don't know, I've just gotten more excited about life. Yeah. And uh, I'm, I, I know it's very early cause he's only 14 months, but I'm curious now as a dad, uh, how, and you know, you found a lot of success in entrepreneurship though, obviously you also, were successful doing the traditional path of going to college and working for a good company. Um, how do you think about what his future might be like or what you would encourage him towards or like what that world is gonna yeah, be like? Well, he's really, really active. And I posted a video in Puerto Rico, like he, his hand-eye coordination is crazy. Like he plays soccer. Like there's eight year olds in our neighborhood <laughs> that are like, he'll run around with them. And like, I mean, he's four, almost 14 months. But he's actually really good. He, he'll palm a ball and pick it up. And he's like, wow. so I have a feeling he's going to be in sports. Like yeah. he's also humongous. I'm six, seven. <laughs> um, his egg donor wasn't short. So who knows what he'll end up being. But the doctor, he's already at like 90 percentile. Wow. I'm hoping he's not as tall as me because six, seven's <laughs> freakish. I'm like, if you peter out at six, four. You've made it work though. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's been a blessing. I love being able to walk in any room and just like get yeah. attention instantly. Yeah. Yeah. But um, but yeah, I'm just of the mindset. I want to expose him to city. You know, we you know we spend time in New York City, but I have this farm in Pennsylvania where he grows up with horses and llamas, and just he loves his horses. And you know, so I just want to give him everything and let him decide what he wants to do. As a gay man, how do you feel like your identity has? played out or not played out in your career? Being gay in New York City is, I mean, even to this day, there's a lot of places not safe to be gay in America. But I was worried as my brand was building, would I alienate, you know, uh, conservative viewers? Of, and at that point, you know, our country still is very divided. So yep. me being gay, originally I was like, is this a bad business decision? Mm. And I think every 
you know, actor goes through that. Anyone, I mean, in life, we all think if I come out, is this going to financially hit me? Yeah. Am I going to be held back from the promotion? Because I'm not. So that went through my head. And, um, and I just realized back to my original advice of being yourself, like people want to know you. And the more open you are, people like can sense of course there's like a balance right you don't want to overextend yourself and sh- overshare but like people want to know who you are to the core and when i think you know humans don't like uncertainty over the people they're going to choose mm. i mean you have to think about it people look at your instagram story screen you got a ton of options and people i think in the influencer space want to get to really know you and be a part of your journey so i came out never once did i see a drop you know some you know a odd comment here or there people being like we don't need to know your you know (laughs) sexuality you know just stick to travel you know (laughs) but in general and i think i have a huge gay audience and you know the gays we love to travel we've got expendable (laughs) income so it's it's been a benefit to my career and you know there are powerful lgbt people all throughout the industry and i always kind of get a high five from those people so I, i think it you know i don't think of the negatives um being who you are and more importantly, <clears throat> there aren't a ton of gay CEOs. And I have a lot of young people come up to me and say, you have been an inspiration to me. I want to be in travel or I want to, um, you know, just be out and be successful or start a brand. And I think being visible to people who don't may not have, um, you know, people in their lives that they can visualize as themselves. Like, yes, I'm very lucky as a tall, privileged white male um, but even just saying that now, it's like, stop, Brian. No, you can still be, you know, an inspiration to people. Um, so I think being authentic, being true, speaking your truth, like, and you're always, often we only hear the negative comments or we gloss over, you know, we fixate on the negative ones, but just for, you know, remember that you're probably positively impacting a hundred times more people than that one negative comment. Do you sort of built this media empire from basically a WordPress blog. And a lot of aspiring creators often ask me, should I blog now? And I'm my take is it's not the best investment right now in, in this mm. particular moment in time. But being that you sort of built this entire empire from blogging, I'm curious, what do you think? Yeah, so I would say, you know, trying to build a digital media empire for views is very difficult. Like the SEO landscape, even for super established sites is, you know, we see big media companies shutting down financially to, in in order to keep an engine, to get the engine up and running, to get the SEO credibility, it's not impossible, but it's tough. Yeah. I would say every creator should absolutely have a website, though. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, not just for brand image, you know, to control your message. So when people Google you, but also like you know, for example, a lot of the point up and coming points, uh, Instagrammers, TikTokers, they have great advice, but TikTok and Instagram are horrible to convert on. You mm-hmm. know, they're not meant really for conversion. Um, and they're meant for you to generate views for them to make money off of, right? So, for example, we at the Points Guy, we have a credit card affiliate program for influencers, but you need to have a website in order mm-hmm. to monetize. And I can say I've brought in a bunch of people. I, I love there's so many cool uh, uh, travel points influencers, freemium traveler. I love uh, Janelle on a jet points by J. All these accounts are great with really solid, fun, actionable tips. But and now they're coming into our points program where you can link to your landing page on your website that is you know approved by the point sky and our compliance team to have credit card offers Mm -hmm. so janelle and a jet who's a big delta flyer like you know here's how to you know her best tips on getting economy comfort or the delta gold card gets you 15 percent back on your points that's how i'm going to rome like but leading people to a landing page that you control and can convert yeah i highly recommend to people to do that because the social platforms while they may give you an audience, so to speak, you don't own that audience and it's so hard to convert. And you know, the algorithms change. You yeah. know, I remember five years ago we first travel points blog to hit a million Facebook likes and we're getting huge twenty percent of our traffic from Facebook and then it just shut off overnight. <laughs> yes. And this is I feel like there's a lot of creators who are weirdly 
a little bit too old to remember how Facebook went from everything to nothing, nothing. instantly. Yeah. And it's like, guys, it can happen again. Like, totally. it can happen it to Instagram, will, it can yeah. happen to TikTok, and it will. It will, exactly. yeah. yeah. So, yeah, so trying to have a, a place that you own, you know, real estate-wise, you know, diverse, basically diversify your audiences. Or if you're a huge TikToker, I mean, get a newsletter. Yeah. If you don't have a site, then at least have a newsletter where you're direct connection because you know when the algorithms change and whatnot but having a direct line with your followers is no matter what you do you want to sell concert tickets books etc like that is an asset and I, I will tell you having just gone through the book sale process like <laughs> things like newsletter site traffic and are much you know potentially much more valuable than just social numbers yeah so you've accomplished something pretty extraordinary you know coming out of this industry what advice do you have for brand new content creators starting today? Yeah, first off, I mean, when I started in 2010, everyone said, oh, you're late to the game. <laughs> so whenever someone says you're late to the game, just be like, that's not helpful, you know, and you're not late to the game. Anyone can be a star today. No one knows what the algorithm is going to favor. No one knows. Believe in yourself. First and foremost, people will tell you you're crazy or that it's been done before. And while I don't condone like copying people, there is plenty when a format works, like sometimes, you know, at some of the best companies in the world were not the first to do something. Yeah. They were the best to iterate on that format. So you don't necessarily have to revolutionize whatever industry you're in, you know, but I you know, listen to your audience, give them a piece of who you are, have a heart, give back, you know, people want to follow people that align with what they do. And I would just push all influencers, like have charities that you support or causes it doesn't have to be political. And I know how toxic that can be. Choose children, you know, like choose humanity <laughs> and use your audience for good. Um, it may not convert. You may not have to get the most views, but like think about who you are and what you stand for and you know when you're outlining your paid content partnerships like also do a personal one like mm. where do i want people to see me um and i will just say and we haven't talked too much about it but you know the point sky was successful but i firmly believe we became way more successful when we started giving back mm. you know we support a number of charities peace jams one of them so we fund the, these youth peace conferences around the world we take nobel peace prize winners to kids around the world and, and we support them in uh, Guatemala, Ghana, Liberia, and South Africa. Mm -hmm. And I've been able to travel to these conferences. It's like 600 high school kids, many of whom are very under in, in underserved communities where they're not getting education, but they have this program and we fly Nobel Peace Prize winners in to have these life-changing weekend-long conferences. Wow. And seeing the evolution and change in these kids' eyes. And then for me, for myself, seeing that change, and then I also get to, I now am good friends with 11 Nobel Peace Prize winners who I, you know, I've learned as a person and I've seen the struggles they've been through and that they inspire me to do more. So, and then my employees now come on these trips and it's the most life-changing trip. So you can weave in your business, your brand with giving back in mm -hmm. really amazing ways. And even if you don't have a lot of money, even just being nice, like kindness is free, being, you know, surprising and delighting people or, you know, making sure to spread love in this world that has far too much hate yeah and um i guess you know speaking of giving i think a great place to end it would be any particular organizations you'd like to call out and maybe encourage people to you know check out their work yeah so i am gay and so fortunate to be out and accepted by my family i had a kid i live you know in a liberal enclave of, you know in the northeast where I can live my life, but so many LGBTQ people around the world have the exact opposite where they are persecuted. Um, so I personally uh, support Rainbow Railroad. So we use travel. You can donate your points, um, donate your dollars and earn points on your credit cards. But Rainbow Railroad helps get persecuted, uh, especially trans people. Mm. You know, in Jamaica, for example, we were just talking about amazing tourist destination, but Jamaica, unfortunately, is one of the worst places in the world for LGBTQ people. Yeah. There is no justice. You can be killed. 
Um, there, so anyway, we help, we use travel to get people to safety and we'll get them asylum in places like Canada and Argentina mm. and the United States. That work, you know, when people ask me, what's the best use of points you've ever redeemed? You know, what first class, what champagne? And it's like, no, to help save someone's life. So Rainbow yeah. Railroad, absolutely. Uh, you know, if you're in New York City, I do a lot with Hetrick Martin Institute. A lot of LGBTQ teens are thrown out of their houses yep. still in 2023. Yep. Um, and many trans youth. Um, so they come to New York City and you know, while the city does a great job of trying to house them, but they also need professional skills and counseling and HMI fills a really critical gap. Um, but also Make-A-Wish, we do a lot with Make-A-Wish. You know, these children who have gone through harrowing, life-threatening illnesses and travel, we all know it. Like when, when you've got a trip booked and it helped boost your serotonin and if you're in a bad mood, just searching for flights can do that. Well, the same goes for kids who are going through these terrible illnesses. They're not all terminal. In fact, many of the kids having this, the wish trip on the books helps them with their healing. And many do heal. Uh, I think there's a notion that all wish kids are terminal and it's so sad, but it's actually one of the most uplifting and it's using travel to heal, mm. which is like, I think the core to the Point Sky business. So I don't know, those are just three that I absolutely love. What's your favorite organization? Uh, my favorite is World Central Kitchen, mm, which I know yeah. you've done a lot Incredible. with as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that's, that's I would say, probably the, the main organization that I tend to obviously give to regularly, but then mm. also like, especially when, it's just amazing how anytime anything around the world happens, they're yeah. there on the ground immediately. Yeah, we need them more than ever. Yeah, exactly. Well, Brian, this was an amazing conversation. Thank you for joining us today. And Thank you for having me. What trip are we going on? I feel like we need to have... <laughs> you got to take me to Greenland. <laughs> Green... No, Antarctica. Have, oh, you, right, done, right. have An you done Antarctica? No, I, I'm having a hard time convincing Serge and the girls. I'm down. Like yeah. it's, But I, I am scared of the Drake Passage, though. Yeah, yeah. Even long before all these viral videos. <laughs> yes. Well... That, that's the one. Brand deals are one of the most lucrative ways that creators can make money. But there's so much information out there about how they actually work. And if you follow some of that bad advice, you could totally ruin your chances of landing the next campaign. So check out this video where I debunk the biggest myths about brand deals. Thanks for watching and we'll see you over there.